Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, Shona, for not mentioning my criminal record. Uh, because it's not relevant, and I don't have one. This evening, uh, despite having little idea of what I'm talking about, I shall attempt to add to the success of my previous groundbreaking lectures by bringing forth further conclusions about modern art with little or no evidence to support them. And I trust that after this address, you will see the Impressionist movement in a new atmospheric and saucy light, leaving you suitably shocked, surprised, and offended. Let me say straight up, um, that there is no abhorrent phenomena in this exhibition at all. Uh, yet I will make the case that there was something very wrong indeed about the artists who created them. This stunning exhibition, Monet and the Impressionists, or mostly Monet, opened on October the 16th, the same night as Miss Pole Dance 2008 at the Enmore Theatre. But that too is irrelevant. There is nothing controversial in this exhibition. It's a blockbuster full of lovely escapist visions that will leave you feeling good with perhaps an urge to do a bit of gardening afterwards. <laughs> with all that sparkling light, an alternative title could be Happy Paint. And why not have a feel-good exhibition every now and then? There's always a Gleason hanging upstairs if you need to come down a bit or are thinking of becoming a vegetarian. I can see a time in the near future when art exhibitions will have a classification warning. But I think we can safely assume that Monet and the Impressionists would get a PG rating. The Minister for the Arts, so tall and yet so quiet these past few months, and the Prime Minister, so easily offended and so neat, could happily, <laughs> happily attend this exhibition without feeling the need to comment. But if a journalist or a television presenter were to show a brochure to the PM, or indeed to the former state premier and leaders of the opposition, both state and federal, they could promote this exhibition with abandon, admit that it was to their personal taste, and proudly acclaim its record-breaking attendance for the state of New South Wales, as though it had, by virtue of them talking about it, something to do with them. Though none could claim to have a couple of impressionists of their own. Now, I'm not calling for moral prohibition or uh, for a classification warning for this or indeed any exhibition. Don't get me wrong or go ahead if you like, as I do feel so wrong so much of the time. And, and as I've been invited back again, it behooves me to share with you my inappropriate understanding of the nature and artistic content of these works and the world in which they were created. So, harmless as it appears at first glance, uh, this exhibition is important to our understanding of modern art as it does go some way to demonstrating how Impressionism was the big bang for modern art. The light, evanescent imagery of the French Impressionists in the wake of Turner pushed for a liberation from the heavy, sentimental formalities of 19th century hoo-ha. Consequently, Impressionism's already dissolving figurative images would give way to the dramatically abstract pictures of the Cubist, Phobus, Phobus and Futurists. And I will attempt to place Monet and the Impressionists in an historical context whenever I feel like it. <laughs> now, some of you may be sitting there and thinking, who the hell is this? And shit, we were meant to come next week. <laughs> but did you know that of all the Impressionist artists, Claude Monet was, and still is, the most famous, most steadfast, most innovative practitioner, and arguably the biggest drug pig of them all. <laughs> Let us start with Monet's youth, or Impressionism, the wonder years. In 1853, when Monet was just 13 years old, the hypodermic syringe was invented. In 1857, the year before Hamilton Smith patented the rotary washing machine, Monet turned 16. This was the year he met the marine painter Eugene Baudin in La Havre. Baudin took an interest in young Claude and invited him along to paint in the open air. 
Later, Monet said that the experience was a revelatory one for him and stated, and I won't attempt a French accent, <laughs> Baudin, with untiring kindness, undertook my education. My eyes were finally opened and I really understood nature. I learned at the same time to love it and it was here that I sh shared uh, my first joint. In 1861, Renoir met Alfred Sisley, Cezanne met Pissarro, and Degas met Manet. Russia abolished serfdom, the American Civil War began, and Elisha Otis invented elevator safety brakes, creating a safer elevator. And Monet joined the first regiment of the African Light Cavalry in Algeria. Although he was contracted for a seven-year commitment, his aunt Marie-Jean intervened on his behalf, and he was excused but had to go to art school as a compromise and talk with a lisp for the duration of his studies. Later in life, to avoid capture and suspicion, he would employ the lisp when needing a disguise. In 1865, the year that Lincoln was assassinated and Lewis Carroll had Alice's Adventures in Wonderland published, Monet decided to share a studio with a contemporary of his, Frédéric Basile. He also exhibited his first canvases at the 1865 Salon. Manet's painting Olympia was also shown at the Salon, attracting moral outrage for its modern, frank and unidealised handling of the nude subject. Monet was a huge fan, but discouraged and angry by society's response to his painting, Manet destroyed several of his own works. What was he on? It is thought he sniffed cadmium, or cadmium oxide, a highly toxic compound found in some oil paints, for he was often seen to have a blue nose on leaving his studio. And it wasn't the last time he would be shut out. Manet was snubbed in 1874 and again in 1876, the same year Melville Bissell invented the carpet sweeper. Edward Manet was the founding father of Impressionism. He, o Hello. Goodbye. he often painted everyday objects such as fruit and flowers. A neighbour, one Monsieur de Ledo, the founding neighbour of Impressionism, once cruelly observed that Manet painted still lives because he was such a bore that only inanimate objects would pose for him. <laughs> of course, this claim is belied by such famous works as Olympia and Bar at the Folie Berger which features a bored-looking barmaid standing next to a deliriously happy bowl of oranges. <laughs> Without doubt, the wonder years were turbulent times for these painters, uh, but a milestone for modern transport. In 1868, due to financial reasons, Monet threw himself into the Seine River. As this did nothing to help his bank account, he sought better advice and got a new accountant. Three weeks later, J.P. Knight invented the first traffic light. Would Monet have attempted to take his life had he known what Knight was working on? It is absurd to speculate. <laughs> Monet was to travel extensively in France and abroad in search of new subject matter, but also initially to act as a drug mule in order to support himself before gaining patronage as a painter. And Monet was not alone in his criminal activities and discretionary use of a pretend speech impediment. In 1870, after an argument, Manet, who liked to whistle when sounding W, believing it made him sound distinguished, fought a sore duel with art critic Edmond Duranty. Duranty, who was pigeon-toed and found parrying sideways awkward, was wounded in the chest but the two of them made up the next day after realising the critic had accidentally used the feminine instead of the masculine form of the word for fruit basket, thus inadvertently questioning the sexual orientation of a plum. Of course, this was also a time of tension between neighbouring nation states. Uh, three weeks after Manet's ungraceful sword duel at Montmartre, Cézanne moved to Lestac to avoid taking part in the Franco-Prussian War. And Monet moved to London to escape conscription to his country's military. Just think of all the people he might have killed or wounded if he hadn't been a pacifist. Sure, we might not have the water lilies today, and this could have been Degas and the Impressionists, but who knows what the outcome of that war might have been had one young painter with a pretend lisp joined the fray. On the other hand, his colleague Frederick Bazile said, 
As for myself, I'm sure not to get killed. I have too many things to do in this life. He was killed in action. <laughs> Despite the rejection of two works by the jury for the Salon of 1870 and the fact that he could spot an unwinnable war when he saw one, Monet was seen to be at the vanguard of painting and was not vilified for his right to avoid getting shot. The Impressionists had become the independents with the notion of a Salon de Refusé, an exhibition of artists working outside academic taste and tradition. In 1871, Monet returned to Paris after the collapse of the Second Empire and the rise of the Third Republic. The following year, a collector, Paul Rouen Duel, Durand Ruel, actually, bought several paintings from Sicily, Monet and Degas, including Degas' racehorses at Longchamp, a lively portrait of a group of horses' asses. In 1874, financial problems caused Durand Ruel to withdraw support for the Impressionist group, so Monet was forced to sell quick sketches and small bags of hashish. Yet, the first Impressionist exhibition was held in Paris. It was one of Monet's paintings in this exhibition, Impression Sunrise, that suggested the name for this new style of painting, which is fortunate, as he almost called it, man in a boat. By the 1870s, in spite of the close affinities between them, each artist had evolved a mature vision of how landscape might be painted. Both Renoir and Monet had formulated a wholly individual manner of painting in the open air. Renoir had a distinctive feathered brush stroke and preferred the pipe. Monet employed a characteristic flickering pattern of small daubed or curved brush strokes and liked to roll his own. Due to his commitment to landscape painting and fondness for duck shooting, he chose to live on the outskirts of Paris and leave the inner suburbs where he'd been fined for practicing on pigeons. A 1983 study by the Académie Pharmacie into the pioneering use of anal suppositories in the diplomatic corps titled, Where To From Here, <laughs> suggested that the smuggling of narcotics and fine art went as far back as the mid 14th century. For instance, fascinated by water and the efficient shipment of contraband, Monet always established his residences alongside rivers or near the sea. In Italy and the south of France, he found both golden light and the trade routes of the Mediterranean, landscapes which inspired his most daring paintings and smuggling feats to date. And Le Havre, on the mouth of the Seine on the English Channel, was to become one of the most thriving French seaports during his lifetime. In the late 1870s, after the death of his first wife, Camille, Monet abandoned the riverside sites to some more remote locations on the coasts of France, to be closer to ports and quiet bays for drug shipments. This is reflected in rough weather at Etretat, 1883, which depicts a couple of young drug runners waiting for a shipment of cocaine. Also look out for Cezanne's The Pond, painted around the same time. Note that the second figure from the left has passed out. <laughs> then there was a big fat schism. In 1880, the fifth Impressionist exhibition was held, but there were several disagreements and Cezanne, Monet, Renoir and Sicily defected. It was the same year that Ned Kelly was hanged in Melbourne and the British perforated paper company invented a form of toilet paper. Monet organised a solo exhibition of his works but not one of them sold. He also did his first interview in La Vie Moderne. His first wife had died a few months earlier, leaving him to take care of two very young children. He was in desperate financial straits and was profoundly depressed. Yet none of this came through the article as he deflected and redirected the interview to suit his own purposes. Degas accused him of frantic self-advertising. A week later, Cezanne, seeing a residue of green in a red traffic light, ran his bicycle through an intersection and caused an omnibus to take out a fruit stand. He got a two-page colour spread in one Paris newspaper and several bad reviews in the critical press. But Degas was apoplectic. The following year, discontent in the Impressionist group worsened. Many artists refused to participate because of the sudden emphasis on realism and an undersupply of stinky cheese. But Degas was a huge success at this, the sixth Impressionist exhibition. Some blamed him for the split in the group and others said he bathed too often. Tired of all the crap going down at the salon, Monet went to the Normandy coast for a change of scenery and a bit of body surfing. 
The Impressionists shared a preference for motifs that veered away from the conspicu conspicuously uh, picturesque, avoiding the hackneyed compositional formats they scorned in the work of salon painters and consequently avoided the tourists at such locations. Monet painted an uneventful section of road outside Vetoyi. Pissarro painted an equally uninspiring street in Pontoise on a dingy, snowy day. And Sisley, rather than painting a fountain in the busy park at Versailles, preferred to paint the pumping station at the Marley Reservoir. All quiet, lonely places and ideal drop-off points. <laughs> Monet did 14 paintings on the Normandy coast. A favourite motif was a customs agent's watch station built during the reign of Napoleon at the edge of a cliff as a lookout for smugglers over the English Channel. Favourite motif indeed, and convenient. This is depicted in Fisherman's Cottage on the Cliffs at Vorongville, 1882. In fact, a fisherman did live in the cottage at the time, but Monet thought he was an undercover government agent and kept a weary distance. The cottage could be reached by a path through cliff vegetation like the path recorded at La Cavie Pouville. Monet's road at La Cavie Pouville is referred to in his diary, in which he wrote that he had meant to set up his easel closer to the beach to await the delivery of a package in a rowboat, but realised he was being watched by one Detective Bagnard, an old foe from his pigeon target practice days, now heading the Normandy Vice Squad. So Monet stopped, and started painting where he was, halfway down the path. And this is the view we see in the painting today. Subsequently, there was no package delivery, but the most famous impressionist with the biggest beard evaded capture and lived to paint another day. Edgar Degas, back in the 1850s, had painted pure landscapes. But by the following decade, he specialised in painting people in everyday scenes, mostly indoors. And although they had shared a friendship with Manet in their youth, Monet and Degas would have a complicated, often brittle relationship. Degas, now prominently the figure painter, once commented, if I were the government, I would have a special brigade of gendarmes to keep an eye on artists who paint landscapes from nature. Known to be both a bitch and a hypocrite, Degas had a relapse himself in the 1890s and, after holding an exhibition of his landscape pastels in 1892, was arrested for the possession of parlour powder, a cocaine-laced sherbet popular with the bohemian set and high-ranking civil servants. He had to appear before a magistrate and was fined for possession of an illicit substance and a weak chin. Degas painted ballet dancers and horse races in a spontaneous, immediate style and protested it was not just because he was in a hurry to place a bet or cop a feel, although he owned several racehorses and was known for his wandering hands. So, was location work and painting outdoors a matter of convenience to satisfy the Impressionist vices or indeed a true passion for capturing the effects of light on the world? Did Degas paint horses and have a flutter at the same time? Did he paint in brothels and have a fiddle? We shall never know for certain about any of the Impressionist vices because they are all dead. In 1883, the year Franz Kafka, Benito Mussolini and Coco Chanel were born, Krakatoa exploded. And Monet and Degas were to lose their old friend. Edouard Manet's leg was amputated due to problems arising from a circulatory disease. Some said his veins just collapsed after all the crap he injected over the years. He died the same day at the age of 51. Some months later, the first major Impressionist exhibition in America was heard, but the works of Manet, Monet, Pissarro, Renoir and Sisley failed to attract any attention. Renoir is recorded as saying, Around 1883, there was a sort of a break in my work. I had reached the end of Impressionism and I reached the conclusion that I did not know how to paint or draw. It was around this time that he went into rehab. <laughs> Monet rented a house in Givenay and started growing his own cannabis and coca plants. It was here that he took the first steps in the process towards fully developing his serial method, explored more deeply with such series as his grain stock paintings, the Rouen Cathedral images, 
Mornings on the Seine of the late 1890s, and then in the first decade of the 20th century, his triumphant Water Lily series. This series method initially came from his habit of setting up his easel at a particular location, then lighting up an enormous spliff. His subsequent impaired short-term memory made him forget what he had just done and to move on to the next subject, causing him to paint the same scene in various atmospheric <laughs> conditions and effects of light. This kept the artist fixed to the same spot for several hours, even whole days, depending on the strength of the weed. And I would argue that often the atmospheric effects he was painting was in fact the haze created by his own smoke. <laughs> and what about haystacks, midday, 1890? They look like giant strawberry cupcakes. Obviously, he had the munchies. <laughs> Monet did 30 versions of Rouen Cathedral. I put to you, this was in part due to convenience. The street in front of the cathedral was a popular drug trafficking hub disguised as a farmer's market. In a letter to Alice Hoshid, dated April 1892, Monet wrote, I'm wrecked, worn out. I had a night filled with nightmares. The cathedral fell on top of me. It looked pink or blue or yellow. These mushies are freaking me out. <laughs> there are 15 pictures in the early morning on the Seine series, all showing the scene from an identical viewpoint, which he painted from a rowboat. Obviously, being in a boat made it easy to replenish the water for his bucket bong. During the 1880s, Monet felt that studio reworking of his canvases had become more necessary, but he was unwilling to admit publicly to his increasing use of studio and cocaine. Even as late as 1900, interviewers gained the impression he painted only outdoors and found him easy to write about because he was always so chatty. Presumably, Monet felt that a full awareness of his methods and coke use would damage his reputation as the pioneer of a natural, open-air vision and laid-back stoner type. Choosing his battles well, Monet supported the major art critic Emile Zola's 1898 article in defence of Captain Alfred Dreyfus, a Jewish officer wrongly convicted of spying for Germany. Degas defended the army. Accusations sallied to and fro until both parties were scandalised and forced to get high. The Dreyfus affair may well have provoked Monet to abandon the French landscape and take off for England again in 1899. He said he went to London to paint fog. By this time, however, the Impressionist lifestyle started catching up with them. Alfred Sisley died of throat cancer and just missed out seeing the motor-driven vacuum cleaner patented that year by J.S. Thurman and then there was the outbreak of the Boer War. Meanwhile, Monet painted the Waterloo Bridge, 1899 to 1901. He took three years and you still can't see it. <laughs> By 1902, Monet had returned from London and took refuge in his own garden at Givenay. With a new century seemed to come a loss of innocence and wonderful new technologies. Renoir discovered forgeries of his own works amongst Durand Ruel's collection, and J.A. Birchall developed the first notepad in Launceston. In 1903, Pissarro died in mysterious circumstances, and three years later, just as the Kellogg's company started selling a new breakfast cereal called Corn Flakes, Cezanne died at the age of 67. Monet, although never as excited about apples, was a huge fan of Cezanne's work and had 14 of his paintings in his bedroom. Grief-stricken by the news of his friend's death, he got so stoned he tried to plant himself in his own garden. <laughs> this was the period he worked on his Water Lily series, which he exhibited in 1909. The year plastic was invented, California legalised the sterilisation of convicted sodomites, and Wilhelm Johansson, a Danish botanist, coined the word gene. It was also this year that Monet and Degas' relationship fell to an all-time low. They were never mates, for two fundamental reasons. Mainly it was because they were French and not Australian, but most importantly, <laughs> mateship wasn't invented until 1915. <laughs> However, Monet did own one of Degas' pastels of a bather in a brothel. The location depicted in this picture could have been a hotel, but it was probably a brothel as Degas was such a slut. He was never interested in purchasing a work by Monet, 
and was often caustically witty when they met. After seeing his exhibition of water lilies in 1909, Degas said to Monet, I remained for only a second at your exhibition. Your pictures gave me vertigo. Later, Monet approached his dealer, Paul durand Druel and said, do you know what that little prick just said to me? <laughs> no. He said, my pictures gave him vertigo. That really cuts deep. Oh, naturally. Bugger him. It's a revolutionary departure from the conventions of landscape painting. Oh, of course it is. This series is a phenomenal achievement. I'd like to see him try to abandon the principle of the horizon as a location of a perspectival vanishing point. I don't think he meant anything by it. We'll see how far he gets without a horizon line. <laughs> oh, please don't do anything rash, Claude. Oh no. Oh no, I won't say anything. No, don't you worry about that, Paulie. I'll say something to him. He must apologise. Nah, fuck it. I'm going home. Chill out by the pond. Edgar Degas awoke the next day to find lying next to him a severed horse's ass. <laughs> In 1911, the year Ernest Rutherford discovered the structure of the atom, Alice, Monet's second wife, died. The following year, the Titanic hit an iceberg and Oreo cookies were first introduced, although the two events were thought to be unrelated at the time. <laughs> then the world went to war and Monet was diagnosed with cataracts. In 1915, after the death of his eldest son, Monet gave up painting for a time. He was full of anguish at the threat to his country by an invading German army, made personal by friends and family being called up. His old friend, the wartime Prime Minister Clemenceau, encouraged him to persevere and even promised the state would acquire his new work. Monet explained his decision to resume painting by saying, there are some French men who can fight. I can do nothing but paint. I must do what I can do. The garden could satisfy all his artistic and pharmacological needs now, as later portrayed in the fictional account of his encounter with the comic book adventurer Tintin. The character of Tintin was a young Belgian reporter aided in his adventures by his faithful fox terrier Snowy and the racist alcoholic Captain Haddock. Created in 1929 by Herge, it was originally published in French, but is now available in many languages, including Mandarin. It is interesting to note that the Japanese artist Hiroshige and Hokusai also influenced Herge during his extensive research for the book The Blue Lotus. Now, this is especially noticeable in the comic Seascapes. And Monet is reported to have said that he approved of the Japanese aesthetic, which evokes presence by a shadow the whole by a fragment. Just as he evoked the world through a fragment of a pool and its reflections. It is perhaps a coincidence or merely logical that the creator of Tintin shared Monet's appreciation of Japanese art. The character Tintin even crossed paths, if only briefly, briefly with Monet in the climactic sequence of the adventure story uh, Tintin in the Garden of Vice in which Tintin traces a dope smuggling network back to Givenet and tries to have the famous painter arrested. I won't give away the surprising ending, but I think this encounter between an historical person and a fictional character illustrates my point with great fortuity. In this scene, Tintin approaches the gate to Monet's property at Givenet, while Captain Haddock sneaks around the back. Look, Snowy, there's a gate. I wonder if it's unlocked. It's unlocked, Snowy growls. What are you growling at, Snowy? Is it a foreigner? A cat darts from under a hedge, and Snowy takes off after it. A cat! Tintin rings a bell on a post. Hello? Is anybody there? He notices the fragment of a shadow of a tall figure standing behind a nearby wisteria bush. A large man with a biker's beard and an enormous sun hat appears. He is smoking a long pipe. The smell is pungent. Oh! Good day, sir. Are you Monsieur Monet? Who wants to know? <laughs> My name is Tintin. I'm a friend of Professor Calculus. Professor Calculus? That old fruit? He owes me money. Oh. And Monet invites him in. 
Tintin tries to lecture the notorious artist about vice and Christian values, while Captain Haddock attempts to alert the authorities to seize Monet's crop. But Monet gets them drunk and they go to a local strip club from which Monet escapes. Tintin has no memory of the subsequent police raid in which he's found in the female toilets eating his own earwax. Of course, uh, this fictional encounter could not have truly occurred as Monet died in 1926 and Tintin was not created until 1929. And in addition to this, Monet was a real person and Tintin was a cartoon character. So perhaps we should not read too much into this fiction and just let cartoons be cartoons. And to conclude, the most important thing to remember about Claude Monet was that he was very, very French. He liked to wear a sun hat in later life and was the first modern artist to sport what would later be recognised as a biker's beard, although there is no evidence to suggest he ever rode a motorcycle. Dying of lung cancer at the age of 86 in 1926, the year A.A. A. Milne published Winnie the Pooh and Harry Houdini dropped dead after being punched, Monet lived the longest of his peers because he had a garden and could grow his own gunja. As his friend Cezanne once said of him, he got high, but my God, what a high. So even if the paintings in this exhibition do bring to mind the pastel interior design crimes of the 1980s, <laughs> I hope that both everyday and all-night Australians will come in droves to Monet and the Impressionists and mispronounce its titles as I have enjoyed doing tonight. Thank you and good night.